Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think I was a couple of minutes behind my apologies. Um, today is going to be very special. First, let me introduce myself and, and the guests here. Um, we have a very important guest today um, that I will talk about very shortly. My name is Bashir Fancy. I am the founder and CEO at uh, BizTech, which is Business and Technology Professional Association of Canada. We are all about ethics, integrity, education, certification, um, mentoring, and really continuous learning. So why this today's topic is going to be relevant, because those of you who attended the 21st uh, January Resetting Business, you would have seen Ian Seward, who is on the screen, uh, on the panel of skills gaps and how do we move forward and some very interesting discussion took place that I would recommend at that point in time, the subjects were apart. So let me um, start now by saying we're very excited to actually welcome Ian Seward from Sevilla Foundation, who also happens to be an important member of our BizTech advisory board. We at BizTech Canada are particularly proud as we are partnered with Sevilla Foundation to help benefit from this framework uh, in Canada and the people who work with us. And we'll release all the details like right now. That is going to be a very big announcement that we'll make next week, hopefully next Thursday or Friday. So you will see how this is all going to tie in. Today, we will talk with Ian, uh, who's the general manager of the Sophia Foundation, which is System Framework for Information Age, uh, from the UK. Uh, so he's coming live to you from UK right now. In this discussion, we'll keep cover basically what Sophia Foundation stands for, why it is so relevant in Canada and other countries. So first and foremost, welcome Ian to, to this session today. Thank you, Bashir. That's a fantastic introduction. My, my, my pleasure, because I think we are very strong believers in, in Sophia framework. So first, why don't we start by telling uh, the audience, I'm aware, but I think the people who are listening to this can understand what is Sophia all about? Sophia, everybody understands Sophia to be the, the framework itself. So what Sophia is, is a skills and competency framework. It is a common language for being able to describe skills and competencies for IT, digital transformation, uh, software engineering, and indeed other business activities and technical domains. Um, fundamentally, if you if you want to talk about a skills gap, you've got to be able to talk about skills. So you actually need a skills and competency framework just to be able to have that common language. So if you talk about a skills gap, how do you know what skills you need if you can't describe them? How do you know when you've got those skills? And how do you go about closing that gap? So fundamentally, the Sophia framework is simply a common language to enable you to discuss skills and competencies. The benefit of that is that it is a global market now. And so having a common framework that is recognized globally is, is actually essential. Big organizations can build their own small to medium enterprises. Well over 75% of world companies are small to medium enterprises. They simply cannot build their own even if they were a big company and build their own, it has little relevance outside of that company. So once again, it's a question of having something that is internationally recognized and, and valued. That, that's very interesting, actually, especially given that we are talking about skills gaps and we often talk about the fact that piece of paper, what does it mean? I got it 20 years ago. Does it, is it relevant to where I have the skills? So that is very, very relevant. Um, are, you, are you able to tell me more about the Sophia Foundation itself? Um, yes, I mean, the, the, the Sophia Foundation um, came along a little bit after the Sophia framework. The framework was first published in uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. It came about out of collaborative work in the UK, um, some of which dating back to the 1980s and 1990s. Um, large companies, UK public sector, professional bodies came together and said, building a skills framework is expensive, let's collaborate and share it, which is what they did. 
And as I said, Sophia was first published in the year 2000. Um, I might be talking slightly out of turn, but usually with these things, uh, when you publish it, the first time you think about continuing support for that is, is at the point of publication. So the Sophia Foundation actually formed a couple of years after Sophia was published with the purpose of promoting, maintaining, making available the Sophia framework for others to use. Um, since then, we have taken on slightly wider remit, if you like, and that is as well as providing the framework and maintaining it, there has grown up um, a global ecosystem around Sophia and someone has to support that. So the Sophia Foundation uh, also supports the ecosystem around the Sophia framework. Um, and that includes such things as recognizing training, um, providing uh, accreditation for Sophia consultants, for Sophia partners, mm -hmm. um, providing guidance, et cetera, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later on when we talk about the framework. But in essence, um, <laughs> we manage the way the foundation, uh, we manage the way the framework is updated, which happens every three years through open consultation. Uh, 20 years ago, that consultation was entirely UK centric, but over the years, it has become truly global. Um, so uh, our, our, our remit has grown to support the user base that has grown up around Sophia. That's fantastic. Uh, now, I think if I uh, understand correctly for the people, Sophia um, Foundation, it's not for profit. Is it really not for profit? And if it is, how is it funding all this activity? Uh, yeah, yes, it is not for profit. It is really not for profit. Um, there is no way for those people associated with um, uh, the Sophia Foundation. So there is a Sophia Governance Board. There is no way for, uh, there are no state uh, shareholders. There's no way to take money out of the, of the foundation. It has been deliberately set up that way to, um, to wholly look after the assets and allow others to benefit from them and make money from them. Now, um, not-for-profit can mean a lot of things, but um, we have to turn it around and say we're not for loss. I mean, it costs money to do what we do. So, um, you know, we, we pay for a website, we pay for Microsoft Office products, we pay for um, some aspects of translations, we, we, we pay for a number of things, we have costs, but um, we raise only sufficient revenue to cover what we do. Uh, if we gain more revenue than we need, we reinvest it in project work to promote uh, the development of guidance materials for others to use. So absolutely, it's it's not for profit. We have a revenue stream. That revenue stream is from licensing Sophia. Um, if I had my way, I would get rid of all licensing, but we do have to have a mechanism for, for, uh, for generating a small amount of revenue. Fundamentally, if you are an individual anywhere in the world, um, or a small to medium sized organization anywhere in the world, uh, wanting to use Sophia for your own skills and competencies development uh, as an individual or within an organization, that includes recruitment, um, then you can use Sophia entirely free of charge. Um, if you are a large organization, typically distributed, we, we expect large organizations to make a contribution. Uh, there is a license fee, it's very modest. And if you are an organization that wishes to exploit Sophia commercially, um, uh, make money out of using the Sophia IP, then we expect you to pay a, a license fee. And um, the license fee hasn't changed in, in six or seven years. Um, we just get more and more people who are willing to use it. It covers our costs, so we don't need to put the prices up. 
Um, but yes, it is, it is not for profit. Uh, I, I know a lot of organizations can't quite understand that. Uh, uh, we've even had people offer to buy the Sophia Foundation uh, and want to offer to commercialize what we do. But I think that would be entirely against the, the ethos of the way the Sophia Foundation was set up. That's actually good. Uh... I would uh, understand about the foundation part since that's what BizTech is all about to uh, try and do similar things, not not the, the framework, but use those type of things to promote uh, the benefit people. So that's, I'm really glad we're doing that. Uh, we're not even charging a dime of fees to anybody. Um, now uh, that sets it up beautifully. Now the question then becomes, can we talk about uh, more about the Sophia framework? If you can explain it in, in the next few minutes. Yes. Um, uh, any skills or competency framework needs to list a number of skills and have some mechanism for saying what those skills are at different levels. And and the Sophia framework in that sense is, is no different. Um, Sophia is a straightforward, um, let me take a step back. <laughs> Um, managing skills and competencies is complex. There's no doubt about that. Changing the skills of individuals and the entire skills portfolio, if you like, of an organization is complex. So, but you need a framework to be able to do that. And so Sophia is um, an attempt, and I think a very good attempt at, at enabling that by providing a simple, straightforward, generic, universally applicable skills and competency framework. And that's what Sophia is. We have seven levels, seven levels of responsibility. And the seven levels of responsibility are described in terms of generic attributes, which if you like, describe your behaviors. So those generic attributes are autonomy, influence, complexity, knowledge, and business skills. And they are used to characterize the seven levels of responsibility. Now, the business skills um, generic attribute is, is very wide ranging and it covers many of the behavioral factors that you expect to find in a, in a soft skills framework. Um, we, we don't claim to be a soft skills framework, but many of those attributes are discussed or described within the uh, the business skills generic attribute it includes things like teamwork. It includes things like an organized approach to work. It includes things like ethics. It includes things like communication, um, uh, digital lit literacy, uh, your personal development, the development of others. So uh, that gives that dimension to the level of responsibility that someone is exhibiting within industry. And then the other component of Sophia is the 102 professional skills. I say 102, that's how many there are in Sophia 7. And they range across the breadth of IT. They're things like um, uh, project management, programming, testing, data modeling, business process modeling, uh, solution architecture, uh, consultancy, um, relationship management, uh, um, digital forensics, um, data visualization, all sorts of different things, which mean that you can, and, and they are described at each of the seven levels that it's appropriate to practice that skill at. So you can think of it as a collection of skills, a collection of generic attributes that you can bring together to describe what someone needs to perform a role. So you can describe a role in terms of its level of responsibility. You can describe that role in terms of the skills that are required to perform that role. And the interesting thing with that is, OK, so you can do that and organizations do that. But what it does do just in simple terms within that organization is enable you to describe all of the roles in a consistent way. And not just within that organization, but within um, a country or across organizations that run multiple across multiple countries. 
that's it in about two or three minutes. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good because it's, there, uh... there is a there is a simple sheet that explains it, and there's a reference guide that explains it. Um, but in simple terms, Sophia is just a common language for describing skills and competencies. It, it, that's pretty good at uh, at a high level because I think the trick uh, here uh, to my earlier comment also is that today's world uh, gets into putting job people into jobs um, because they know them they say I like this guy or whatever as opposed to do they have the right skills for this particular job right and where you you went with it is to say what skills do you need and that's critical yes well y yes it is but it also it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't put someone into a job or role if they don't have the skills but if you know what skills they've got and you know what skills you need you can determine development paths correct you, you can, can also develop career paths so it allows you to you know, I'm not saying you only deploy someone with the right skills. You oh, could no, no. deliberately deploy someone who has a skills development need. Um, you could move someone on to take on a more challenging role. Um, you can backfill with some um, uh, perhaps lesser skilled person or lesser influencing person who needs to get that sort of development. But without a framework, you can only do that by, by gut feel. Right. But the key here is that you then build that person up. When you put them up, you know there's a plan to get them there, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can always use things negatively, but the whole idea of, of Sophia and the whole ethos behind it is, is from a positive perspective. It's not a bad thing to not have the skills required um, because you can develop them. Right. Uh, that, that's a very important uh, point. So given uh, what you parked at the high level, which is pretty good in uh, two, three minutes, is that in Canada, and I think it's true of many parts of the world, but we want to talk about Canada, but, <clears throat> is that there's a significant talk, as we had in January too, about skills gaps. We're seeing that because technology is moving forward at a rapid pace, um, and we're seeing all those skills gaps for whatever reason. Uh, and um, Sophia is a skills, uh, framework, competency uh, framework in Canada, especially, but I think it's true everywhere. Is isn't Sphere the answer? Um, well, of course, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> it yeah, is the we, answer. We can, we can talk. Um, but I but I'll try and back that up. Yeah, because, right, exactly. Um, everyone is talking about a skills gap. It's not a problem just for Canada. It is it is a global issue. Every single country is talking about a skills gap. Um, there are countries that have do not have a significant digital economy yet, and they want to create a digital economy. There are all, uh, countries with significant youth unemployment, and they see the growing digital um, economy as a as a as a source of employment. And there are organisations that are uh, sorry, there are countries that are very mature in their digital economy. Who, who just want to do more. So yes, there's the, the issue of the skills gap is something that is probably the most talked about component at the moment in, in terms of IT and digital transformation. Now, the challenge is characterizing that. Everyone can say there's a skills gap, but what does it mean? And actually, is it a skills gap or is it a knowledge gap? And is it just a, a supply and demand um, issue? Whatever it is, um, you you have to have a mechanism to describe it, and Sophia provides that mechanism. That's the fundamental. It provides that mechanism. But the really interesting thing is that, um, and and it's a peculiarity of Sophia. Sophia is used in about 180 countries around the world to a lesser and greater extent. There are some massive use in in a number of countries, and there is a relatively small use in in others. But the key element is we've done nothing to promote that. The Sophia Foundation has done nothing to promote that. We've just made the framework available. Now, you can make a framework available. You can make stuff available, but no one's going to use it unless it passes a couple of core criteria. The first is really that it is usable. And the second is that it's useful. 
And if you don't promote it, the only reason people will pick it up and use it is because it, it ticks both those boxes. So the Sophia framework is, is both of those things. It enables people to, to work with skills and competencies and develop them. So now comes the really interesting bit. And the graphic behind me sort of illustrates that. Um, the sort of round graphic on the right hand side. And I don't expect people to be able to see it from there. It's all available on the website. But that is the Sophia framework. That is what is the Sophia framework. The graphic on the left hand side, which I'm hiding more than usual there, I'm trying to clear it. That talks more about where Sophia can be used. So if you have a skills and competency framework, you can. You can design and plan and manage the workforce that you've got. You can acquire the skills you need for, the, for, for what you currently need and in the future. And if you're saying there's a skills gap, if you can define those skills, you can at least turn around and use a mechanism to, to acquire those, gap, those skills, whether that's recruitment or internal growth. But either way, you've got something to talk about. If you've got a useful and usable skills framework, you can deploy skills that are necessary to do work. You can deploy the resources on the basis of the skills needed. You can also assess the skills of individuals, the skills of the organization to determine whether you really do have a skills gap and use that information to determine how you might close that skills gap. Uh, you can identify the, the skills gap. You can identify mechanisms for how to address that. Probably the most powerful is internal growth rather than pure recruitment. Um, and you can build capability and performance of your organization because it never ends. We talk about a skills gap today, but Sophia was built in the year 2000 from previous skills and competency frameworks going back to the 1980s. There was a skills gap then. So absolutely, Sophia can help you do that. It is only a framework only a tool but it is incredibly useful incredibly usable and internationally recognized so how does it affect canada well just as it does for any other country you can pick sophia up and use it um, uh, if people are interested ever in building we help another number of people build skills frameworks um, I can tell you how much it costs. I can tell you how much it costs to maintain a framework regularly. I can tell you how long it will take you to achieve that and how long it will tell, take you to get significant global recognition and use. Um, we've been going 20 years, so that gives a bit of a hint. Um, but the problem is a today problem. So do you build your own or do you adopt something that's already there? And Sophia, as a not-for-profit foundation, provides a framework that is useful and usable. So within Canada, for example, an individual can pick up the framework, they can read it, they can find out about it, they can determine, use it to determine the skills that they might need in the future for their aspirational career path. Um, an organization can pick it up and determine what skills it has, it can determine what skills it wants, and it can put together a program to to close that gap. It can also use it to manage its workforce, define the roles that it has within. Um, you know, there are other use cases as well. You can turn around and say, uh, one, one of the big areas is um, uh, a number of countries have fairly substantial public sector uh, IT components. Nearly always within those countries, the individual ministries, the individual departments are essentially autonomous units. Um, but they actually have very, very similar approaches in what they do. So what you can do is you can use Sophia across public sector. And we do have a number of countries with public sector wide licenses. They can define the skills and competencies that they want and put them into roles that are common across different departments. That allows for a greater um, mobility of current employees. It allows for a greater equivalence and interaction with private public sector. Um, and it allows uh, 
those organizations to make use of the supply chain. You can turn around and say, we want resources with the following skills at these levels, and you can use a common framework. Countries as a whole can do that. It's much more difficult to, uh, you know, an individual can manage their skills, an organization can manage their skills, a large uh, distributed employer can manage their skills. What does a country do? What could Canada do? If there's a skills gap, Canada could adopt a common global reference for skills and competencies. Um, it can, can contribute to that in terms of its direction in the future, but it can use that common foundation across all activities. And that's an incredibly powerful tool. But I would say that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you would say that, but that, that is a couple of uh, things uh, that you said, which are very important. One, because of collaboration, you actually get the benefit of the best and you know experiences of other people who may have already been before you've been and tried something and saying this is actually very good a so that's very powerful as opposed to doing it going alone to the framework because if those who are familiar with finance side of business and i've done a lot of work there um ifrs the whole purpose of that was to make sure that if you look at a balance sheet or profit or loss whatever whether it was in japan or Asia Pacific or any other country, it actually reads the same because, you know, gratuity means, what does it mean? Tips? What does it mean? So there are some terminologies and stuff that are used. They've always caused problems. This is consistent regardless of where. So it allows the movement of not just within companies, as you quite rightly point out, but even if you were doing from country to country, right? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, I'm, I'm making some assumptions about Canada. It's probably the same as many other countries. It right. probably, for example, outsources a fair amount of its software development to low cost centers, for example. Right. Um, one of the challenges is making sure that there's a compatibility of skills. You know, if, if you take the view, we want um, a solution architect operating at this level of responsibility, and you want one of them from a low cost center, um, then you've got something to base on, uh, base what a solution architect at level five is. So that common language is, is really, really important. Um, as I say, we translate now into currently 11 languages. We just added Russian. We added uh, French Canadian um uh, a couple of years ago uh we have all the all the usual suspects of uh you know japanese chinese arabic french italian german english um spanish uh whatever um and we only do that it's it's very expensive in terms of effort and time We'd only do that if there was a user base willing to do it. Right. And you talk about collaboration. The Sophia Foundation is, is really only coordinating the collaboration of many, many people all around the world. The vast majority of, of which are volunteering their time to, to do this. And they are all users of Sophia or learning to use Sophia, finding that it is useful. And we just harvest their, um, their expertise. Um, you know, uh, the way these things are normally done is to run it like a project. Let's go and build a framework. Here's a budget. Uh, we'll get half a dozen people together to, to sit and write this thing. Um, and when the project is over and done with, that's it. And then if there's any update, oh, let's have another project. The reality is that doesn't actually work. What works is the fact that the people who are, the people who are using it are the ones that are telling us how it needs to change and develop. And I can't emphasize enough how important that is. You can, you can, you can, you can run a workshop and ignore and have 20 or 30 people that come along to it. 
and 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 actually ignore the comments you get from it and and no one's the wiser um in Sophia 8 which i can talk about a little bit later on we've we've had working groups in australia for example and, and elsewhere in the world where they themselves are sitting down and working out what needs to change and then it goes to as a a design authority to say yay or nay we don't like that word or whatever but you cannot run this like a project otherwise the focus becomes on focus the focus is on delivery of anything rather than on delivering something useful right that's very powerful that comment is very very powerful and i think um you touched some very very interesting areas there because it, is handled that way, uh, it does address and, and uh, addresses a lot of the challenges of today. And because it's a dynamic, evolving, just like you touched on the fact that there is Sophia 8, which means it's not a static thing. As the needs are identified, the developments continue as opposed to what we've seen. You know what, folks, one of the things which is uh, interesting, I won't go into that, but I've been wanting to do this for quite a few years to bring it uh, and uh, make this uh, arrangement. Thank God we've done it. Better late than never. But there's, the need is even greater right now than ever before because of all the things that are changing around us. So that's uh, uh, very well uh, kind of described by Ian. So Ian, is, is the foundation just a, a skills framework or is it more than that? Um. Was there more to there, 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 Yeah, there, there is much, much more than the skills framework. And, and that comes from a, a, a change, if you like, in the way we operated. It is true to say that when Sophia was first published, um, the, the way of using it was to phone up, write in, whatever, and you would get a, a printed copy sent through the post. <laughs> and and that was it. And it was, it, it's not true to say that it was a question of, well, we'll do whatever you want with it. It was a question of, well, here it is. <laughs> Over the years, um, the ecosystem, the community of users has grown significantly. We have had one or two conferences where people share ideas. We have had a lot of people talking about how Sophia needs to change. We have had a lot of people coming together and saying, what we'd really like is guidance. Um, and so a few years ago, um, it was probably true to say, although it wasn't right in and it comes through the post, uh, the power of the internet meant you could, <laughs> you could get a copy, download it free of charge um, and use it. Uh, the mindset was, well, we need to support the user base. And we do that in a number of ways. First and foremost, we provide the framework. Absolutely, that is our core, our, our core function. The second thing is we provide some guidance about how to use that. Now that guidance has to be generic. What is appropriate in one domain in one country is, is not necessarily absolutely definitive for another domain in another country. So we, we harvest good practice from around the world. There are organizations, uh, we found out the other day, we, we don't actually know all the users, but there are some massive, massive users. We found an organization the other day that everyone will have heard of, an enormous organization that uses Sophia across thousands of employees, many, many um, uh, role descriptions, has been using it from 2005. You know, they've been using it for years. Now that sort of organization has a wealth of experience and we talk to these organizations and we harvest good practice and provide guidance we also do a couple of other things um, and again it's the power of the website that's allowed us to do that and we will be doing more but um, here's an interesting thing people talk a lot about knowledge um, and, and, and and we do in Sophia so we decided to try and find out um, about bodies of knowledge and about two years ago, you couldn't find a list of bodies of knowledge. You could find one, you could find another one. And if you wrote the two down, you started your own list. We actually did that. 
we have gone out and harvested and found, in, in fact, something like 37 significantly well used bodies of knowledge. And we've just made that available. So now there is somewhere on the internet where you can find a list of bodies of knowledge. I'm not saying it's exhaustive, but you can find information out. And all we have done is add guidance, um, information about bodies of knowledge. We've provided views of Sophia. So how is, is Sophia used with cybersecurity? How is Sophia used in an agile world? How is Sophia used in big data and data science? What about DevOps? We, we've added views to allow people to say, ah, that's how you do it. Um, yeah. And we continue to do that. Now, we also recognize that there are organizations that want to exploit Sophia. So we, uh, we, 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 we have partner relationships and, and accredit organizations to do that sort of thing. We also recognize that some end users want help in how to use Sophia. So we accredit Sophia accredited consultants. So there's so much more that we actually do. And then on top of that, the one thing that you will not see directly is the infrastructure we've had to build to maintain a framework. Um, there is, as I say, if you run it like a project, you don't build the infrastructure necessary to support it long-term. Sophia has done seven updates. We are in the middle of our eighth. We've been running 20 years. That provenance, that sustainability is doesn't come cheap in terms of money or effort. And we've put the effort in to make that happen. No one sees that because, of course, <laughs> it's invisible. But okay. you can imagine it. How do you translate into 11 languages? It takes a lot of effort to find people willing to do that because you can't run it through Google Translate. You can't give it to professional translators alone because they don't understand the topic. You have to find practitioners who can refine that and make it real. The context becomes very important there, uh, for sure. So yeah, that's very true. So given what we have built in this uh, chat today, um, we all know, if you really turn around, yeah, 2020 was, um, pretty bad from coronavirus standpoint. But if you have people who are in the systems who actually uh, were also paying attention, they would know that hacking and cybersecurity problems are the worst uh, ever in 2020. It's not got better. The guys who hacked our friends next door uh, and everybody's aware of solar winds and all that. By the way, they're not out of the system. So you can tell you it's a pretty bad problem. So, and this, type of attacks and all that have continued and get only worse by the day and exposes us in terms of now cybersecurity is a very hot topic as a result of that i know uh, why don't you speak to the fact that how does sphere address this uh, issue yeah um I'll, I'll come on to that in just one second because i'll say something that sounds almost quite negative and i don't i don't mean it in a negative way <laughs> okay um Sophia is a generic framework, and therefore it needs to be usable across a, a whole wide piece. Um, cybersecurity is a specialism. So how do you fit a uh, specialism into a generic framework? And the way we do that is relatively simple, actually. Um, we recognize cybersecurity, information security, which is perhaps more far reaching than includes cybersecurity, is certainly a topic of the moment. There's no doubt about that. Right. Sophia, funnily enough, even before security was being talked about mainstream, had a number of security skills in it. Um, from the very start, one of the original authors thought information security was important. And so we have had and information security skill and a few other bits and pieces from the year 2000. Currently, um, within Sophia, we have five, in Sophia 7, we have five explicit security skills, digital forensics, uh, penetration testing, um, security administration, um, security, and uh, information assurance, information security, information assurance. Also within Sophia 7, 
um, we have 20 other skills that um, have components of security in risk management, um, solution architecture, design. Um, so, th so that's how we do it. We include security into existing skills. We add skills if they are necessary. And that has led us to take a slightly different view to the security community. And I, I, <laughs> I'm wondering whether the ice is gonna get thin under my feet with this, but um, Go for it. there is a massive spend on security at the moment. Everybody is, is paying millions of dollars for, for security um, education, security training, security certifications, all of those sorts of things. Um, in the UK, we have an initiative to professionalize the security profession. Um, but actually, Sophia takes a slightly different view. Um, security is a component of everybody's job. Yes, there are some people who are security specialists and need more depth to their security knowledge, but you're not going to you're not going to make systems secure by adding security to them. You're going to make systems secure by designing security in from the start. Yes, there's specialist knowledge required, but actually. Every designer needs to be thinking about security. Every architect needs to be thinking about security. Every coder needs to be thinking about security. You can't just turn around and say, you've got a group of secure coders and everyone else isn't. So we take this view that security is a component of everybody's job. So we have explicit security skills, digital forensics. We have security in many other skills, risk management, for example. We don't name it cyber risk management because otherwise we need another one called um, environmental risk management, business risk management, but the core skill is the same. And also security is in every generic, sorry, is in, in the generics at every level. Now, the big advantage of this is that, yes, we can accommodate security specialist roles by defining them with Sophia skills, because a security specialist needs non-security skills as well. We can also include security into the skills necessary for non-security skill, <laughs> specialist skills. And the really big advantage of this is, is actually quite simple. So there's a shortage of skills, skilled people in security. What actually does that mean? Does it mean there's a lot of highly competent, skilled people who do not know some relatively simple security knowledge? Or does it mean they couldn't possibly do the security job? If you want to enhance the security of systems, you need everybody to consider security. And if you've got a shortage of people addressing security risk, you can find highly skilled risk management people who can be trained in the necessary components of security, given the appropriate knowledge. In general, it is easier to re-knowledge someone than it is to re-skill someone. It happens quicker. And, you know, I don't want to say there isn't a skills. That's not what I'm saying. No. But if the only solution to your skills gap is to ignore all the people with those skills and create a new, a new group of people with those skills, you're gonna take a long time to do it. It's far, far easier mm -hmm. to move people with transferable skills than it is to create from new. <laughs> you, you know, there are two, three things and I'll recap from my side because they're very powerful what you just said. Um, when I um, had a risk management in, in security for Visa, uh, and I was also the global head of internal audit, uh, when we started the PCI standard, it was not because we were the best in security in the world, is because that's not what the companies were doing. And since we couldn't get them to change, we said, okay, you're not gonna change, then when you touch my credit card or debit card, you will follow the standard. Unfortunately, it's become a tick box, right? Checklist, rather than mm -hmm. that's problem number one, which is a major issue. Second issue where you talk about is that you cannot have good security just because one guy is handling it here and the 95 people have no clue what you're doing because they're the weakest link, which means exactly what you just said. If we are really truly going to get the security up, 
everybody has to be involved and understand at minimum at least understand those challenges and risk management yeah Become yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's another element to this, and that is quite simply that there are so many specialists. Right. And 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 when I started in this industry, um, uh, or rather a little while after I started in this industry, there was people had really quite siloed roles. Right. And and what's happened is those mm. roles become blurred. And there's almost an attempt to go back to a silo. You know, there's the security people and there's the non-security people. Well, we link to uh, the cybersecurity body of knowledge from the UK. We link to the, the NIST cybersecurity <laughs> framework. The reason we do that is we are not cybersecurity specialists. And um, I don't want to be cynical about bodies of knowledge, but, you know, the maintenance of a body of knowledge is no different to the maintenance of, a Sophia, of the Sophia framework. You can almost turn around and say the body of knowledge is out of date the instant it's published. Right. Uh, but but if we took on that, we would have to understand, we would have to manage the body of knowledge for business analysis, for data science, for cybersecurity, for architecture, for usability, for all of those sorts of things. And we're not experts in all of those. What we know about is a skills and competency framework. So we want to partner hmm. with those experts. Right. They know about the breadth of IT. That's what we cover. What they cover is the specialist knowledge. Now, I would assert that we can, using Sophia, define a, a role, a security role and a non-security role using the Sophia skills and the, the levels of responsibility. Um, including such things as digital forensics or, 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 or penetration testing for security. If we can't define that role, then there's a skill missing in Sophia and we should add it. Right. Now, and, and that's the mindset, but it's kind of the way we link. But I still think that, that cybersecurity folks need skills outside of security. Um, they may well need to run a project to do with security. Um, that's not cyber project management, it's not. project management. <laughs> and I would also assert that people who develop business systems or whatever systems need to know enough about security. Right. And of course you defer to specialists when you don't have the knowledge or when it's a bit beyond your competence at present. You, you know, Ian, you described something. I'll just <clears throat> give you something last 48, 72 hours that happened that I had involved with. It kind of tells you this big organization is going ahead and buying some tools, okay? Significant amount of money is being spent on requirements and stuff that they had done 18 months ago, 12 months ago. The world has turned upside down on security and many other issues of what's happening. And because the silos are, you know, alive, well, and kicking in all these big organizations, nobody talks to the other guy to find out, by the way, we're doing this. Are these requirements still valid? Because they budgeted for it, they spend the money. That's number one. So we have a hell of a problem with people not understanding exactly what you said. The problem, I think, number two, is because of the labels, like you quite rightly pointed out, forget the cyber business, at least when I was running, we didn't use that uh, term. It was security and you got physical security and logical security. And you got on the other side, uh, when you look at uh, the risk management becomes really uh, right on top of that, because if you don't understand that, I don't know how you do a good job of, uh, of this because you need to understand what are the actual risks. That said, that mindset would not happen if people actually had this competency in skills from because they would understand broader. And your point is very, very powerful about the fact that everybody has a security responsibility. That is not how. So corporate world, especially Conlon if you're listening to this conversation, you want to take a step back and rethink. This is how you're structured. Not question of good or bad. You need to rethink. And perhaps this can help you tremendously. So here's my next question then, um, because you described very well how you approach the um, cybersecurity uh, from a standpoint in the specialisms, whatever specialisms there, which are quite a few. 
Are you using the similar approach for other areas? Um, I, in general, yes. Um, the reality is that, as I said, Sophia is a generic framework. And so we have to accommodate all sorts of specialisms. Um, the other hot topic is, is, is data science, for example. And, and in a similar way, we, we address it, sorry, we address it in a similar way. Um, I'm not suggesting data science is part of everybody's job, but some of the elements of what I've said with regards to security are equally applicable to data science. Um, now, it's an opportunity now for me to introduce slightly uh, another sort of dimension to things. I've talked about knowledge and I've talked about skill and they're, they're different. You know, you, you can have knowledge without having skill. Funnily enough, you can't really have skill without having knowledge, but you might not have as much knowledge as that other people think you need. So the question is, um, we link to bodies of knowledge, which is great. Um, so when you're talking about a skill, there's a similar thing, knowledge and skill, to skill and role. Is the role a data scientist or is the skill data science? And I, I would assert the same with security, um, that they, there are elements of a for a data scientist, which are data science related, and there are some that are not. And again, with Sophia, I would assert that you can build the role of a data scientist. Um, we currently, and, and there's, there is a fight going on on this, we currently do not have a skill that is called data science. However, if you ask a bunch of data scientists what they do, they'll start talking about things like analytics. They'll talk about data visualization. They'll talk about machine learning. They'll talk about data governance. They'll talk about programming because they nearly always have to process data. They'll, they'll talk about all sorts of things. And all of those things you'll find within Sophia. We have an analytics skill. We have um, a data visualization skill. We have programming skill. We have a project management skill. So you can create a data scientist role. You can define that in terms of skills and levels. You can define a senior data scientist role. They might be the same skills. They would be at a higher level. You could define a head of data science role. And a head of data science may not be operational in analytical activities. So actually the head of data science may not require, may not require an mm. analytics skill. So you can, you can build the data scientist role. So we cover it in much the same way. Now, a lot of people would like us to rename analytics to be data science, but you have to cover every an angle from um, someone who is doing an element of relatively straightforward analytical work um, up to people who are doing quite sophisticated machine learning type activities. And there's a number of changes going on in Sophia 8 to address that. But we have a Sophia view for big data, data science, and we address it in the same sort of way. And just as we link to the, um, for security, the Cyborg in the, the NIST cybersecurity framework and various other bits and pieces, we link to the data science body of knowledge. Um, Sophia is a way of integrating these things. Uh, someone might be a data scientist today, they might be something else tomorrow. And these skills are, many of these skills are mobile, which is why we've got to be generic. This actually is very powerful because again, I had a challenge with a big financial institution whose different divisions had completely different data on what we were actually trying to work with, which uh, if you had somebody dealing with this properly, perhaps they could you know, uh, reconcile that. And uh, we know that organizations also have 60% data, which is duplicate data. So that doesn't help what we're trying to do. So, um, but it actually brings it to light. When you do the thing, what you're talking about is a very powerful thing because it helps them. And you have, done a pretty good job of trying to explain and lay that out so um on this coffee part on this on this fireside chat i'll go to the last question 
for the day, which would be, um, obviously, we know you're working on um, Sophia 8, as you've mentioned um, a couple of times. The question is, what are the things we can expect in Sophia 8? Okay. Um, well, well, one of the core things is you can expect it to still look like Sophia. Okay. Sophia is an evolution. Um, so, and, and there are still organizations using Sophia 5. If it's useful to them and they don't see a need to change, why should they? We're, we're not mandating people updates, you know, or, or whatever. We, we support things in the sense that it's still available. Um, Sophia 8 will look like Sophia 7. We uh, plan to release Sphere 8 in Q3 of this year, which is roughly three years from when we released Sophia 7. We have had huge, massive engagement from around the world in discussing what needs to change, how uh, ideas for what things should be. Um, all of that is visible on the website. We don't hide anything away, it's transparent. So not only can you see the change requests and raise them, and anyone can, you can see the discussion that goes on around those change requests. <coughs> and rather amazingly, you can see under, on the website, under future Sophia, you can see the next version being created. So if you like, about six months ago, future Sophia oh. was an exact copy of Sophia 7. Future Sophia now is an edited version of that and new skills will be added. Um, we are addressing a number of themes again. We're looking at cybersecurity yet again. Of course, we have to do that. We've been asked to look at scientific and high performance computing. And um, I, I say that uh, we looked at it. We, <laughs> we didn't look at it. Um, various workshops involving many, many scientific computing people um, actually wrote new skills for scientific and high performance computing, which are going before our design authority board as we speak. Um, we will be reviewing AI, machine learning and Internet of Things again. Uh, there are already aspects covered in Sophia, but maybe we don't bring them out as well as we could. We are going to look at behavioral factors, refresh, excuse me, refresh the generic attributes. Um, we're going to look at employability, bridging the gap between education and, um, and employment, um, a number of other things as well. And one of, the, one of the biggest things we're doing, which actually in itself will result in no significant change to Sophia, but it is a huge activity, is we're looking at the readability of Sophia. We are rewriting Sophia. That may mean that a skill doesn't change, but we are rewriting it because over 20 years, it has been created by many different authors. That was fine, provided your first language was English. We have come to the conclusion that we need to write better English for people whose first language is not English, and this has been brought out by the headache that we've created for our translators who, you know, translating an English language where the subject changes two or three times between it with a whole list of things in between and maybe 40 or 50 words long is not an easy task. So, you know, we're, we are rewriting it to make it easier to read, but it will be recognizably Sophia because thing that has stood the test of time everybody likes is the seven levels of responsibility we can refine how it's presented we can refine the language and make it better and more contemporary and include current thinking but fundamentally people like Sophia and we cannot change that because no one has suggested any better solution and I have to emphasize, it's not, you know, I say we, I, we, a small number of people are coordinating this activity. We have a massive list of people to thank. Um, we can't thank them all. We do keep track of a few names, which runs to thousands, well, not thousands, it runs to hundreds of people, but we cannot possibly thank everybody. Um, 
but we try to make it very clear that it is the input of others and by association they should be they should feel quite proud of what they've done i i think it's fantastic and one uh parting message for today for me would be BizTech or Business and Technology Professional Association of Canada is really proud that we're partnering with its fear, but also inviting people, organizations, corporate world, uh, volunteers to join us because we do not have non invented factor problem here. We really want to take the best. And as I said, Sophia has that. And we think it's the timing uh, of this is actually incredible because we do need this. It can really help as it's helped many companies across the, the globe. Um, so work with us. I'll put some of the link. We're going to make some couple of big announcements next week. So you'll see a lot of detail. In fact, we've got Sophia on our website. So you can you see it'll give you a link straight back into exactly what uh, Ian was talking about. So um, please. Join me in first thanking Ian for a fantastic uh, uh, chat this morning because he actually have outlined brilliantly what uh, not only Sophia does, but why it is really critical and useful because, you know, and it's not about, like you said, not about project management delivering on this date. It's delivering quality, uh, which actually benefits people. So you do it, it takes two weeks extra, you do it exactly like that. And, and the end product is fantastic. And I can vouch to that. And you've probably seen, as I said, uh, Ian uh, before on the panel and uh, as he's also a very important part of our advisory board. So Ian, thank you very much for a fantastic uh, uh, presentation or discussion today. And we'll be in touch as we make this big announcement. And uh, I think you outlined brilliantly. My pleasure. Happy to happy to talk about skills and competencies. Happy to have any follow up that people may have. Um, contact me through the Sophia Foundation. It's relatively straightforward to find me. And, um, and, and they'll yeah. find you because we got uh, the Sophia link all on our website, and we'll make yeah. it available because as we and we're recording this thing, we'll make it available. So it's fantastic. I really appreciate the your time uh, today and what you were able to do. It's, I think people will have to listen to it two, three times because it'll sink in because there's a lot of wonderful things packed in there. So many thanks, many thanks. My pleasure, Ian. We'll uh, look forward to catching up. One second here. Um,